But next up onto the inspiration stage, we have Niels Anderson, who is the Direct and Promo and Activation Jury President. From his experiences and early learnings at Art College to those from today's multi-channeled and connected world, Niels is going to tell us why it all starts with a pencil. So please welcome now to the stage, Niels Anderson. And the trumpets, there you go. Good morning. Um, my name's Nils, and I love pencils. Now, um, I've had some criticism for this image, and I wanted to start with this and dispel some of those criticisms. No, uh, I'm not gay, uh, and I'm not kissing a pencil for any particular reason other than I believe they are really fundamentally important to what we do. Um, and I hope it didn't come across as pretentious either. I was simply trying to make a point. And that point is uh, that the simplest start point and the right thinking and the right processes can lead to great execution. So really the purest, the purest start point is vital to everything we do, particularly today in this multi-channeled world that we live in. And when I say the right start point, it, it doesn't start, and it must not start on a computer screen. That is a wonderful place for reference. The whole world is, a, there's so much you can now find through that box that sits on your desk. But do not start there. You have to start somewhere else. You have to start at a pure, simple place. A little like Matt was just talking about being curious and almost naive in its simplicity. You start somewhere else, and then you garner all of those other things that you've learned in life, seen in life, that have affected you, and then you pour them into starting something. It could be a simple line. Well, I like the pencil I have in my pocket. It could be a dot. It could be multicolor. One of the things I learned at art college, I thought I could draw, and I went to art college thinking I could draw, but actually I found out that I really was just there to start to learn how to draw. I found out that you, rather like an artist having a palette on one hand and a brush in the other, you hold seven pencils, color pencils in one hand, and you choose the color in the other hand, and you continually switch those colors. So the versatility of that pencil to make a mark, a unique mark, not one that comes from someone else's mark that you put down, a unique mark, is a wonderful thing. And it is very relevant today. I, I, this was about a year ago, I went to Facebook and I spent a week there. And what I thought was fascinating was that they are struggling with the same things we're all struggling with. And there's an interesting wall there. That I, and I sort of got there, and the first thing I saw was chaos. This kind of wall of chaos of sketches and people's signatures. But in fact, what they were really trying to work out was how to do things that connect with people. There is so much out there now. There's so much clutter. It's an incredibly cluttered world. How do you make sure things connect? So ultimately, they are really trying to do things with quality. Imagine the days of where we are just talking from an advertiser to the general public, people are therefore receiving and hopefully reacting. Those days are over. We're now at a point where people are central to things. They only pass them on if they're interesting. They only use them if they like it. And the whole debate at Facebook was about people are going to have to advertise on that site. They're going to have to pay money to advertise on that site. How is it truly going to be effective? So it's a wonderful time to be in the business because we genuinely have to make things that connect, original things, not things that we find from someone else that's out there, but original things. Combine that, I've worked in China for 10 years now, and I was going to talk a little bit about some of the issues of working here. There are Asia issues to being original and I think there's an amazing breadth of talent in this part of the world, don't get me wrong, but there's also a use to being a receiver culture here in the business that we do. And we have to, the center of gravity of marketing is moving from the classic old centers, it's moving this way. We have to get you used to being originators, to truly finding a spark and a place 
that comes not from someone else's mark, but your own mark. We have to finish things with quality, not half finish them, not finish them, oh, it doesn't matter, it's okay to kind of finish it, but not at that level, because that's way too expensive. But no, you finish it at the right level. It's not always about expense, but it often is, because great people cost money. But that's okay, because ultimately the return on that investment is far greater than short-term thinking. Global brands are going to come from this part of the world. If you look at what's happening in China right now, it's not, on, it's not only America now, if America sneezes, the world catches a cold. Now, just as has happened in the last couple of weeks, bad figures come out of China, it affects the global stock markets everywhere. So this is, there's dual pressure. Global brands need to, or brands, Chinese brands, need to make sure that they're connecting with the Chinese consumer and ultimately grow beyond the country. Therefore, a domestic demand-driven economy can actually keep growing. So be original. That's what we all must do in this part of the world. So some of the basics of how to do that, okay? Have an idea. I'm not going to talk about insight here today. I'm assuming you all know what that is. It is inherent that it must be in everything we do. You have an insight. That idea and insight combined. Now, you then execute it. It's a two-stage process. It is not idea and execution in one. It's not find that thing on the computer screen, pull it into pull it off that desk onto your desk, adapt it, retouch it in-house, take it to a client, the client sees it, as so often I've experienced, they go, oh, we love that. We really love that. Well, let's just run that. And then you're in a point where you say, well, well we want to photograph it, we want to illustrate it, we want to film it. And they go, well, you've, why? That's just going to cost more money. Let's just run that. Well, no, that's not what the world's best brands do. And that's not how we should operate. And let's just talk a look, uh, take a look at the world. Um, this is a chart, not by me, but by the great Lee Clow. And I think it's, it's very true. And I think we're really, if we're all really honest with ourselves, most of the work, this is not just an Asia thing, this is worldwide, most of the work produced is from bad to ignorable to boring to mediocre to ordinary to kind of okay. Much of the work that we're making out of the people in this room is probably in this area, okay? 90%, 10%, 10 is where it should be. And it's damn hard to get there. If it was easy, we wouldn't all be striving for it. But in that space, to be breakthrough, change the category, to be different, contain a human truth, to be charming, likable, funny, all of those connecting parts are all in this area here. And it has to be brilliantly executed at the same time. Hard to get in there, but, but vital. Vital for powerful brands to be there. So I just want to show you an example of what I think is, um, is, is really a perfect example of idea, execution, over a, such a kind of a period of time that a brand has really become at one with its marketing. And it's Apple. And they make incredible products. But can you imagine Apple without its marketing? I wonder what it would be like. Some of you might think, well, it'll just be still great, right? We'd still buy the product. But I wonder, if, I wonder if you can really pick them apart. They're almost like a double helix. And then they sit as one, perfectly in tune with one another. Chopping and changing and checking social, digital, mainstream. It's a wonderful continual flow of conversation. So the best brands live in that 10%, and this is an amazing example of how to do it, over a legacy of many years, decades, from the start, a partnership between an agency and great product makers. And product having that pure simplicity of the pencil making the mark, original product. You don't feel Apple's a version of someone else's product. They are truly disruptors. So I want to show you a very current piece. It's winning awards around the world right now. A wonderful in-the-moment piece, just showing how Apple are so current, yet so also traditional in, in their craft skills, but so current also in how they 
communicate. Idea, turning the cities of the world into a gallery. Now, I live in Shanghai, and I saw this work on a, a great media buy, one long street in Shanghai, and on a gray day, a somewhat polluted day, and it transformed that street. A truly wonderful experience and a way of integrating advertising and marketing into, into a kind of daily life and a city environment. So idea, turn the, cities, uh, turn the cities of the world into a gallery. Now, you could have kind of done that nicely. Could have done that on a small scale, one city. But instead, they went, let's just really go for this. We're going to do it. We do it properly. We use real photos from real users, but we actually adapt the choices of those photos depending on the city. So the craft level at every single level, a choice is made. The craft level is, is impeccable. Here's the case. These Apple billboards just changed. They're no longer ads, well, not traditional ads. They're photos, all taken with the iPhone 6. to world fame, all thanks to a cell phone picture. How cool is it to see your photo on a billboard? I have a big billboard, the largest billboard in Singapore. Mm. One of my goals is to go to one of my billboards. I think there's one in New York. I've lived in China for roughly 10 years now, and I, I just really want to expose you to some of the cases that have all started with this, either literally or in my head, um, that I've worked on over the last 10 years. Um, Gap, the launch of Gap in China. Interesting case, because this almost didn't get made at all, and the biggest debate of all was ultimately not over the execution, but over whether it even happened at all. Gap came to China. The CEO of Gap said, why on earth would we do a China launch campaign? Just use the global word. And to her credit, the, the Asia marketing director, she said, no. You have one moment in time with this brand. Um, you, have, you have this chance, and it's gone. All right? And you use this moment. And that moment, it was literally based on this, that the awareness of the brand Gap in China was 10% name awareness, right? No one had Gap stuff unless it had been bought off a copy stall somewhere. So people knew virtually nothing about the brand. There was no store in the country, and so we were gonna launch two stores in year one. No store in the country. So our advice to Gap in the US was this, all right? Simply do it right, look at your entire 40-year history as a brand, look at all the best bits, Throw off all of the worst bits because nobody knows anything about you. You can be your best self to an entire new public from the start. Okay? You will never get that chance again because once you open your doors and you use work, international work, which ultimately they will do, that's fine. Once you've done that, you've lost your moment. Okay? So introduce yourself properly 
into what's potentially the biggest market in the world for you when they know nothing about you. In the end, the marketing director won the argument and we ended up making a China launch campaign. Uh, it was based on an idea as simple as this. It was a, it's a liberated world. Let's face it, if America and China don't get on, the whole world's in trouble. Okay? It's a liberated world. Gap had always been about liberation. From Sharon Stone wearing a white Gap shirt to the Oscars, supermodels wearing Gap jeans on the cover of Vogue, to Dress Down America, which Gap was very much part of, Friday, casual Fridays. So Gap were really at their very heart a liberator, a kind of a liberator of the casual. Um, and so our execution, our executional idea was America and China are going to hang out together. Equal platform, no superior power to one another, just hang out together. So we wrote a manifesto, let's laugh, cry, kiss, fall in love, run, dance, skate, be free. Have fun, cut loose, escape, wear what we want, live the dream, and be ourselves because it's a big, beautiful world out there. Let's live it together. Okay? Kids in China don't care about trade wars and politics and policy debates. They just want to hang out with people. They just want a piece of what they weren't able to sample before. We put this into the store windows of the new stores that opened. We wrote it in Chinese, big country, different tiers of cities as we call them. Tier 1 cities, international language is okay. okay. Tier 2, Tier 3 cities, you can't do that. So you actually have to involve Chinese at the right level for the right audience. It's a giant country. Many different countries combined into one country. The launch work was, and it used well-known people, but it did not use them just for their superstardom status. We used them because they had a liberated cause in each case. So here was Zhou Shun, China's, probably China's finest young actress, and Philippe Cousteau, who's the great-grandson of the Jacques, great Jacques Cousteau, who'd become an American citizen. So American and a Chinese person sitting together, they are both environmentalists. Okay? These shots were all taken by Annie Leibovitz, so we, you know, one, of the, one of the arguments back to, the, to, to Gap at the center was, we need the world's best photographer to capture this moment. And he went with it. It actually ultimately didn't become a conversation about money because we'd won the argument, the argument about whether we needed to do it or not. It was simply then doing it properly. Okay? So gap together. Let's gap together. Let's get together. Whatever, whatever level you choose to read this at, whether it's simply an introduction or you read it more deeply, it's in its simplest form uh, about two nations coming together. Uh, Pharrell and Angela Baby. Um, I think somewhat they're kind of disruptors of, of their own industries in a way. Angela Baby is beautiful, seen as in some ways the perfect Chinese beauty, but she's also had a lot of work done on her, which uh, raises some questions in China. People love her, people hate her, but that's interesting. Pharrell has some similar things going on. He questions things. He pushes it. So we chose this pairing for that very reason. Um, we had uh, Julia Frakes on the right there, who is a celebrity teenage blogger, fashion blogger. And we had Momo on the left, who is a teenage sensation, who is an illustrator, or a kind of animator and illustrator. It's become a huge sensation in China. We just paired those two together. And it was interesting watching the chemistry on the day, the, the day of the shoot between these people. It was just a genuine kind of, it felt like there was a unity and a reason why they were, they didn't sit there coldly together. They sat there. And, and generally, genuinely hit it off. We had musicians. Interesting, this one only ran in print, and uh, we, we couldn't actually run this outdoor because there are tattoos on the arm, and in China we weren't allowed to show that. Uh, we had the founder of Twitter, and we had a big Hong Kong movie star. They're both in the digital space trying to push it. The founder of Twitter was obviously getting involved because he wanted to make sure Twitter was somehow going to get into the borders of China, so far hasn't made it. We had DJs, and we had the photographers themselves. Because this wasn't just Annie Leibovitz, we also worked with Wing Sha, one of the best photographers from this part of the world. So we combined it right down to the very basics. 
Usher, Joe Lynn, uh, artists. And the final image was, and I, I just felt it was important that, that people weren't left with a legacy of, of fame leading it, was just of two girls. No one knew who they were. It didn't matter. In fact, it mattered that no one knew who they were because they were just the future. They weren't boys, but they were girls, and we chose it intentionally to be girls. Big media buys, classic, a way, a way that, uh, rather like Apple actually, that Gap have this very confident way of buying media. Here's the case. This campaign is is very, very important, and we realize that we represent our, our countries, and we realize that it's bigger than both of us. I think it's a very interesting campaign. I mean, uh, East, West, I mean, you know, the world, is, the world gets smaller by the day, and at some point, the, the more communication, more we are connected to one another, uh, the more positive that is. I love the symbolism of what this shoot means because as we go into the 21st century and a new young generation, this represents putting the, the challenges behind us in the past and history and moving forward together in a way that, that, that we can build a world that, that is safe and that is free. Outside of the fact that uh, Gap is a brand that we both are very familiar with and support, you know, it is our collaborative efforts that make us stronger in music that make us stronger philanthropically, that makes us stronger as people. So when we do fill in those gaps in life, magic happens. The idea in this campaign was to simplify the look, you know, uh, very, very much, and just, you know, see, the t see two people together from two different cultures. We realized the very first day we photographed, um, when we were bringing American uh, culture together with Chinese culture, it was very, very powerful. Everyone understood that it was something bigger than just photographing clothes. On the other hand, I think what's always been extraordinary about Gap and the clothes is that it, it's very democratic, uh, Gap clothes. It's, it's, you know, everyone can wear it. You can see that Gap is a very common culture. So this Gap is brought to China and China. It's a very common culture. Everyone can be communicating. Gap may have influenced the world Gap不是一個很明貴或很有名的很開心中學生著小學生著 可能看似有不同的东西，其实创造出来那种艺术是还蛮特别的。所以呃，希望这一次的广告出来，可以让大家看到很特别的冲突性，但是有有一种和谐。Getting a chance to work with Annie is one of the the great experiences, great honors of my life. 跟他在一块工作，我觉得非常就是自然，特别随便，就是。when I was a child going to school, I couldn't afford clothes to go to school, and when the Gap came along, they created clothes that became hip and cool, and everyone could wear them, and they didn't cost that much money, and it was powerful. The, the, the look of what is fashionable doesn't have to be expensive. So I've always admired the gap, you know, for that. But uh, that being said, uh, you know, it was a brilliant idea uh, from Gap China to pull these two worlds together. Gap It was part of a much bigger campaign. There was social, there was content creative, there was a whole social aspect to it. The Gap history was told. There were concerts between Usher and Joe Lynn. So it was uh, quite a scale to the whole thing. Ultimately, it won Brand of the Year in Asia, which was a lovely thing to get, not why we do all of these things. Interesting point at the end, 
is it got Gap to look at themselves long and hard. And in fact, the marketing director who fought so hard for the campaign is now the worldwide marketing director of Gap. So they pulled her into the center to affect change on the entire brand. Alienware, up next. Uh, they came to us uh, a few years ago now uh, with an interesting challenge. Alienware niche, kind of cult following uh, from gamers. They make truly, you know, unless you want to build, unless you, it, I don't know who's a gamer in the room now, unless you build your own kit, this is, this, this is as good as it's going to get. Gaming gear, all right, as a computer goes. Uh, Alienware, though, had an issue. They were so cult that, in fact, they kind of, they kind of couldn't grow beyond that cult status. Miami-based company, they were owned by Dell at the time. Dell didn't quite know what to do with them. So they came to us, they needed to infiltrate the China market particularly, but actually they came to us for a global relaunch, which is what we did. Um, we came up with an idea which was about ruling the universe, as aliens no doubt will when they turn, finally do turn up. Um, and there was a kind of a biomechanical aspect uh, or spin we put on this whole thing, that if you buy an Alienware product, you buy the technology, yet you are skin and bone. You combine with that, and you become almost biomechanical. You become almost, you become almost superhuman, all-powerful. Uh, some sketches here. So back to the pencil. We started with sketches, even though this was about gaming and online and computers. And we really just tried to work around. In fact, there seemed to be an obvious place to start ultimately, which was the head. The head just felt like a gift that we had to do something with, the GIF, the logo. So the more we got into it, we thought, well, actually, if the spin is biomechanical rather than just an outline of a logo, how do we truly then create a family of biomechanical beings that you can kind of join? Now, in, uh, and this again comes down to execution. Rather than being CGI, which could have been a way to do it, or it could have just been illustrated, another way to do it, um, or we could have just pinched stuff off one side, combined it with something else, and kind of finished it up, which is the way often most people have done this. Instead, we went to a great photographer in Paris called Dimitri Danilov, who's probably the world's best surrealist photographer. And he said, right, we're going to create the kind of stage one, stage two, stage three of this. So we created a set of models, created six models, all right? And then we sampled into those models biological aspects, backs of beetles, sheep stomachs, all sorts of biological things into the kind of hard metallic structures of the models themselves. Sheep stomach was the middle. On the right there, on the bottom, on the bottom uh, left, it's actually the back of a, of a beetle. And we sampled and mixed all these things together. We then cr came up with, uh, with that family, that family then imposingly stared down on you and, and talked to you, greetings weaklings, we don't come in peace, on earth we can hear you scream, um, and so on. So there was a confrontation. Uh, but this was mainly a digital launch in 35 languages across the world. Here's the case.
Next, Land Rover. A wonderful brand to work on. We worked on it for many years in the UK. It was a pleasure to work on it again in Asia. Um, to the edge of the world, that's where a Land Rover can take you. So the idea was to just embrace that. Let's not be complex with it. And the execution of this, we decided was going to be the Truman Show. Here's the sketch. And this is all we showed to the client. We didn't do a high finished anything. We just showed this. UK client, China client, both said, great, let's run it. These were the images that we created. Interesting here, difficult to get a car. This is in the time we had to make this, difficult to get a car into the right places. So we worked with an Australian photographer, landscape photographer. Um, we worked with him on shooting different locations around the world. We then, in a studio, shot someone against a white psych with a shadow. And then the car came from our office in New York. So we had retouches in New York combining all of these elements together into a series of three. And this went onto dealership walls, went into outdoor in the uh, streets of London. Argos launch in China against the backdrop of other online delivery companies. So Argos is a British online delivery company. All right? How do they get into the China market with any kind of presence or originality? They came in with a quality story. Lots of criticisms over some of the Chinese online retailers. Are you getting a fake? What are you getting? How is it delivered? Does it arrive broken? They came in with a quality story. The idea was to really drive home quality. And executionally, we just did it around specific facts and made out of the boxes themselves. Here are the sketches, some of the early sketches we did. Again, we worked on drawing it, not on finding it from somewhere else. In fact, it sat in front of us. It was the box itself. We looked at the box, and the box itself was the start of the whole thing. Then it actually started to get built. We worked actually with uh, some model makers in Singapore who, made, who literally made all of these models and hand painted them out of the box materials themselves. And here are the final, the final stories. This was about speedy deliveries, happy speedy deliveries. Everything literally made out of the product. This was about um, authentic products, so inspection of every single one to make sure that it was really authentic, not a fake. And this was about great savings, so the Pied Piper of Hamlin kind of making a, a trail of money follow him into a toaster which looked rather like a piggy bank. Samaritans, next up. Um, I'm guessing you all know what the Samaritans are. Uh, they are there for you. And we, again, just stayed on the fact that uh, we needed to kind of deepen the involvement of people with the Samaritans. They are there for you. It's just a call away if you have trouble. Um, the execution was we're going to bring the conversations to life. Right? So this wasn't actually, but it wasn't done through words. It was done through images. Here are the sketches that we did. And this is all we had at the start. Okay? So it was drowning in drink. We're here to break it, break the bottle, break the habit for you. Um, lost in a sea of gambling debts, there's a lighthouse. Um, family arguments at home, nowhere to turn, there's someone to rescue you. And ultimately, we went to an illustrator in the UK who really, and we gave this job to him because he felt unbelievably passionate about it. And we just felt that his passion would get transferred into the images. And he just went for it. And this wasn't about a huge spend. You know, Mar Samaritans don't have lots of money. But he wanted to do this. And we all got together and really, really committed to it. And as you can see, from the sketches to then the final images. These ran in Hong Kong. Um, Little Bamboo is an um, air cleaner air cleaner company. They wanted to stand for something, or air purify company in China. They wanted to stand for something more than just being another air purifier within that market. Idea, working for cleaner air. Execution was to spotlight the illegal polluters. This was the sketch. And um, 
breathe again was the result. Here's the case. Xiaozhu wanted to stand out in a market that was almost as congested as the air. A market where half a million people, mostly children, have died due to air pollution related illnesses. Factories are responsible for up to 65% of this pollution. So we decided to put a spotlight on air pollution's biggest culprits by using the actual pollution from the factories as a medium. We projection mapped pictures of children choking on pollution with our message on the toxic smoke spewing from the factory's smokestacks. People took notice, and the word spread. The video of the projection was filmed and released online. The video received more than 17.3 million views in a week, reaching millions more on social media. More importantly, Xiaozhu received 4.8 million visits to its website and a 38% increase in brand awareness. We also cleared the way for Xiaozhu's entry into the congested marketplace. Okay, finally, Gap. Uh, Gap, sorry. Penguin. Final piece. Um, Penguin's market is about is the middle class Chinese, about 300 million middle class Chinese who are interested in learning English. That's a very important part of of their future. And uh, here's some work that we did. Uh, the idea was live the story. Um, it's about audio books. Audio books is a great way of of learning English in that you are. You, know, you, you become part of the story, you become one with the story when you listen to that story in English. Um, the execution was, we took the penguin, penguin from the logo itself, and we animated the penguin, we brought the penguin to life uh, with a microphone, as if the penguin was eavesdropping on an original story. Here are the sketches, and these were the very, very, very original sketches, and I struggled with this actually at first to quite understand it, but when I got into it, I really got into it. There's a little penguin with a mic, and again, and again, under Sherlock Holmes, Dracula, and tales of Greek heroes. And then the illustrations developed. We used eight different illustrators from eight different time zones. So we had America, we had Canada, we had France, we had Ukraine, we had China, we had England. I'm missing some out. We worked with this incredibly intense project because there was a lot of conversations overnight to just get this stuff done. It took about three months to do. But in the end, the workings took shape, took more shape. We had penguins with long mics, or long booms, short booms, borders, no borders. One of the hardest things to get right was the type. And in the end, as soon as we put on type, Mac-based type, it felt as if they didn't go together in the medium. So we actually went back to the artists to get them to draw the headlines from the ads themselves. This was the final series. So, the pencil. The humble pencil is not a humble pencil, it is the great graphite. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Niels Anderson, thank you very much indeed.